Hello, my name is Marcus. I'm the compiler of a collection of therapy quotes entitled Psychoanalytic Self-Awareness Quotes. This is TQ905. Uh, this is a, a long one, so um, I'll do it in parts. Therapy quote number 905. We all live in two worlds at once. An inner world where the self of our early life is still bogged down in early traumatic life situations, and an outer world of the present day where we live subject to interference from this inner world, i.e. through our projections, parataxic distortions, and repetition, compulsion, transferences onto it. The interaction between this internal world of psychic reality and the external world, world, Klein writes, quote, as far as can be seen, there exists in the small child side by side with their relations to real objects, but on a different plane, as it were, relations which are based on their relations to their unreal imagos, both as excessively good and excessively bad figures. Ordinarily, these two kinds of object relations intermingle and color each other to an ever-increasing extent." Unquote. The interject of parents, a kind of mental incorporation with subsequent internal elaboration of the parent images into imagos, differing widely from the real parents, takes place under the stress of maternal libidinal unavailability. Neurosis is seen to be not merely a phenomenon of disturbed emotions. If it were, it could be relieved simply by abreaction, as was first hoped. It is a phenomena of inner world psychic structuring. Okay, so this is a continuation from yesterday's video, 904. So 905 is a continuation of 904 um, regarding the, the schizoid um, pattern. We're using this term schizoid pattern in this series just in, in, in its broadest sense of feeling that one's emotions have become kind of withdrawn uh, to such an extent the person... Um, feels uh, he has a need to be in touch with them, but he's afraid to be in touch with them. So it's sort of a schizoid dilemma. It can, there's different degrees of this. And um, in 904, so we talked about this to some degree. So this 905 is a continuation. Um, this quote is about Klein's main idea. One of her main ideas is that we live in two worlds, the internal world and the external world. Now this internal world, there's there are uh, is based on the child's memories. These memories condense, coalesce, um, and uh, the theory is that these condensed memories get to the point where they even, as a way of talking about them, we say that there's an image there that that represents all of these condensed memories. So there's interactions with the satisfying. So the times when the when the baby uh, was satisfied with the satisfying mother, there's an image in, in the internal world of a satisfying mother. So in myths and fairy tales, that'd be like a goddess figure. And the times when the mother is unavailable, there's an image of the other uh, that's uh, unsatisfying. Right. So the theory is the child has these two um, in his psychic memories. He has an understanding of his mother as being a satisfying version of her and an unsatisfying version of her. Right. Um, now normally, uh, with enough love, these split images come together and the child gets a, a whole understanding impression of his other, the mother, as a whole person. But sometimes if the child doesn't get enough love or if there wasn't enough maternal libid libidinal availability, then the splits are still there. That's considered a developmental trauma if, if the splitting images are still there. Now, because of the small size 
from the baby's point of view, we theorize that from the baby's point of view, the mother's like a giantess in the nursery, and the baby thinks in images. Uh, so if he's thinking in images and he's dealing with the giantess, the theory is in his uh, in his mind the images are wildly exaggerated uh, because these images are based on the baby's perception with his mother. Now these images themselves are infused with the child's feelings so they get exaggerated as well because of the child's own feelings towards these images or memories. So that's the theory, right? So that's internal object relations, right? Now this inner world where there's a, so in the case of a developmental trauma uh, and there's an inner conflict, so you have the image of the satisfying mother and the image of the unsatisfying mother. Now this unsatisfying mother subsplits into the enticing part representation of other and the rejecting part representation of other. So now there's six part images of, or imagos now. So the, for, it starts off as an image, but then infused with the child's emotions, the images warp, they change, they become exaggerated. So now we're calling them imagos to make the distinction. Connected to each part image of the other, there's a part self-representation in connection to each of those parts. So with the satisfying image of the loving mother, there's an image of the self that's loved with an image of the mother that's uh, enticing. There's the image of the child that's enticed and hopeful. The image of the mother being rejecting. Then there's the image of the self uh, being un unloved and all that, feeling hurt and, and so on. So there's this internal object relations world. And uh, we live in these two worlds. And Klein says, this world influences how we see the external world. Right? So there's an intermingling there. That's her main idea, that we live in two worlds, right? Okay, and the idea of being uh, dysfunctional or neurotic or living an unsatisfying life, let's say, to keep it simple, it's because this internal world, uh, there's too much... Uh, the memories of the frustrating mother are so great uh, therefore, the child's life force is in this constant inner world situation where the child's emotions are caught in this inner dilemma of trying to master the trauma of the child needing mother's love and being refused by mother's love, uh, um, or mother's unavailable love. So there's this inner conflict here. Right? Um, so if the child has a secure attachment style with the parent, the child's inner world is calm, harmonious, peaceful. The image of the other is um, loving. It's a whole person. The image of the self is uh, whole. It's loved. So there's inner calm there. The person sees the outer world through that kind of lens. If the inner world is filled with this inner conflict of trying to master the trauma of needing love, not getting in love, and the, the, about the, the in, so now the rejecting side of the image of the Mago is now termed uh, the inner critic or internal saboteur, someone called it, um, you know, and so on. So, so the, the main idea is this inner world is, is what causes any kind of dysfunctional behavior because it's influencing how we see the present behavior through our projections, parataxic distor Parataxic distortion means the need to see the present based on this internal imprint. Or we transfer the past situation in childhood into the present to try to heal this internal world. Right. Um, so the idea of healing is therefore to heal this inner world. That then that heals. Um, it's more realistic, and then we see reality more realistically. If it's more damaged in the inner world, we're not seeing the present realistically. We're seeing the present through the traumatic memories of childhood. So we're not seeing the present realistically. So projections, parataxic distortion, transference, repetition, they distort, they all distort reality. So she's making the point here. If someone's dysfunctional, it's not a question of just remember something and then feel it and then it's over with. Uh, it's more than that. The person has to heal the internal um, psychic world. Um, one idea around healing the inner world is if a person... 
has a little more understanding with, of these models, it might help to heal the inner world. And that, uh, and as we heal the inner world, we see the world more realistically. And that helps to re-internalize more positive perceptions. So there's a back and forth between the inner world and the outer world. There, there's that comedy movie called Two Worlds, a French movie. Um, with English subtitles, uh, 2007 or 9 or somewhere around there, the guy, uh, uh, they, they showed it, uh, they showed two worlds. The guy was transported to this, through a tunnel, through this other magical world. And as he healed uh, his inner world, represented by this magical world, his unconscious, we, we see him transported back into the present, and his present world was better and healed. Representing that link between the inner world and the outer world, the idea that we live in two worlds. So, if we want to heal the outer world, we have to heal the internal psychic memories, the inner world. Right? Now, this inner world, how do we know what's there? How, how does it exist? One theory is that's what myths and fairy tales are for. They're there to describe this inner world. If there's a trauma with the child, those split images are still there. Good. So, now in mythology, that's the good god and the bad god. Okay, that, that represents the good mother and the bad mother, or good breast and bad breast. Or, um, I'm overly simplifying it, but that's, in other words, myths and fairy tales are true on the inside, not on the outside. So long ago, myths and fairy tales were the psychology back then, you know, to describe the inner world, to give validation, to give acknowledgement, um, that kind of thing. Okay. Uh, Okay, so the ne next part here, in reference to a guy named Adler, when Adler seized on the sense of inferiority as the starting point of the neurotic process, he had in fact made the first approach to what we now know as the schizoid problem. So he's saying they're basically synonymous. So this series doesn't cover Adler at all. This series doesn't cover many of the famous names. There's no Lacan, there's no Jung, there's no Freud, there's no Adler. Uh, there's no quotes. This series is, um, the mentors in this series, the six mentors are Karen Horney, James Masterson, Edmund Burglar, Melanie Klein, Margaret Mahler, and William Fairbairn. Now these quotes here are from one of Fairbairn's students. I think Fairbairn considered uh, Guntrip as a, his protege kind of thing. And he and it seemed like he did pick up where Fairbairn left off and he, and he added some clarification to it. Um, so, so uh, and, and, and Fairbairn's student, uh, Harry uh, Guntrip, see he, he has a book about the schizoid pattern where the emotions are very withdrawn. And if that's the case, if the emotions are very withdrawn, he's saying that this other therapist called Adler, he's calling that the in inferiority complex. Okay, so he's, he says they're the same. If a person has an inferiority complex in object relations theory, that's called the schizoid dilemma. Their emotions are detached. If your emotions are so detached, it's because the child didn't get loved, he felt devalued, he felt unwanted, so he feels inferior, he has that inferiority. Remember, complex means a constellation of memories around a certain theme. So if the theme is the child was, an un, was unloved, all of his memories of the mother being misattuned, not offering her maternal reverie, not offering her loving gaze, not offering her uh, life force availability, her, her motherly essence, her mother... Uh, her motherly ministrations and care and all that. Um, so all of these memories around that condense, coalesce, and this condensation uh, or this constellation of these memories, we can then say it's a complex. So it's an in, he's calling it the inferiority complex or the feeling unloved complex, let's say. Or the, in, the, in the jargon here, it's the schizoid uh, dilemma or schizoid position or schizoid problem, that kind of thing. 
Um, okay, again on that, Adler's inferiority complex theory was the form in which he discovered one half of the whole problem, the client's struggles to find a self with which to relate to others. Okay, if a person has the schizoid dilemma, how does he relate to others? He's, he, the relationships, there's an emotional connection, but if he's afraid of his emotions, how does he connect? So he's saying that's the, the jargon or the form he's talking about the schizoid, uh, the, the inferiority complex or the schizoid problem. The, the, the client, the person's struggles to find his feeling self okay, from which to relate to others. He doesn't know how to relate to others. Okay, if he gets close, he thinks he's going to be engulfed or impinged upon, so he withdraws. Then he thinks he's going to be abandoned. He's afraid to be abandoned, so he steps closer emotionally. Now he, he fears he's going to be engulfed. Then he steps back. And the schizoid dilemma is that he's oscillating back and forth emotionally with everyone all the time like this. He never settles and forms this, a regular mutual emotional connection with someone. He's just caught in this back and forth need fear need fear back and forth oscillation kind of thing and he's kind of stuck in this oscillation that's the theory of the, the schizoid dilemma and then yesterday we gave masterson's uh, analogy of, of that okay so this yeah, adds a little bit more to it the idea that adler was talking about the same thing but he used a different term his term for the schizoid dilemma is the inferiority complex and then adler had this whole thing i guess that as a defense against it, he would create a false superiority complex as a defense against feeling the pain of the inferiority complex. So this would be like a pseudo strength or a, an aggressive power front. Um, but it's not out of uh, the real self. It, it's it's a it's a out of fear. It's it's a fabrication out of the fear of the trauma. So there's that kind of reaction formation kind of thing. Someone said the superiority complex is a sign of arrested development. A superiority complex is a sign of arrested development because if the trauma takes place so early on, infantile megalomania is still there. Yeah. So the theory about that is that uh, in the beginning, uh, we theorize, or it's been theorized that if the baby were to have thoughts about his experience in the womb, it's as if he were to think he were some kind of god because all of his needs are automatically met. He has a thought, wish, need. It's just met. In the afterbirth of the first few months, that continues in the extended womb. During the stage of symbiosis, in the stage of undifferentiation, in the stage of fusion with the mother, he has a wish, need, and mother is attuned and meets the need. Now, if he's stuck there, he, he's still stuck with that infantile megalomania. Right. So that's, uh, the, or the superiority complex springs from that, not getting the symbiotic needs met. To, to move out of, the, to move to the next stage, out of the, uh, the developmental process. So for the first six months, that's called the stage of symbiosis. At six months, with enough love, the child hatches out of that egg, but it's a slow, gradual hatching from the from six months to the age of three. At the by the age of three, infantile megalomania is resolved, but if there's trauma, uh, the child didn't get enough love, so he's still he's still clinging in this negative symbiosis with the mother. In, in his internal optic relations, so he's stuck with the in, so he, because he's arrested there, he's fixated there. Um, that means, by theory, he's he's fixated in his infantile megalomania, or another term for it is the superiority complex. Okay, next one here. What emerges as you go deeper into the childhood of some clients is that. Their problems in relating now in adult life are not simply due to lack of love and support to reach whole object relations, psychological birth and access to the real self, but to the fact that unresolved omnipotence fantasies are exaggerated efforts to manufacture a pseudo relationship out of hurt and anger or the will to power because genuine personal relations have been non-existent. Yeah, that's quite a statement. The child wasn't seen 
in his own right as a little person and there wasn't a mutual relationship between the baby and the mother as two people interacting as two people maybe the mother was busy and couldn't offer that and as a result of child felt objectified used exploited felt like a thing let's say um, in other words his feelings wasn't recognized his needs wasn't recognized okay so out of that to compensate for that the person has this exaggerated this, a manuf exaggerated efforts to amp up their omnipotence fantasies to compensate for it so he's saying that's something to look at not only that he didn't that he has arrested development in general but more specifically uh, that he's caught in this superiority complex so um, in other words, a client might think, uh, a therapist might think, well, he has arrested development. Uh, okay, let's offer him a secure attachment style with the therapist. Um, let, let's, uh, um, you know, uh, confront his infantile immature defense mechanisms. Let him know that he no longer needs to use them. He feels safe now to have an, because he's in a new relationship. He's going to internalize the therapist. Now he feels safer. He's going to heal the splits, differentiate. And, okay, and, and then reach the psychological birth. That's that's fine. He he's adding a little f f emphasis here. That's that uh, is aided if the person also keeps in mind the person's exaggerated emphasis on his infantile megalomania. So he's stuck with this so-called power complex uh, or will to power. Uh, he's saying here, okay, because the child didn't have a genuine mutual relationship okay so there's that dichotomy of love or power right the, it's um, if a person feels love he has genuine heart power let's say if he didn't doesn't have that sort of uh, connect feeling power let's say or uh, connection to himself kind of thing uh, he's going to react in out of fear to this so-called pseudo uh, He'll relate to others in a pseudo relationship based on his anger, hurt, hate, envy, spite, greed, and all of those things. So that could be the narcissistic pattern, for example. Okay. Um, yeah. So just a little fine fine point there. One more from one more regarding Adler. Adler held that the neurotic builds up an unreal world to live in. He can live in it or not as he chooses, and he more than suspects its unreality. So maybe the person with the, so the neurotic person in broad general terms, he's saying um, maybe he's projecting, maybe he's afraid to live in the present, and he kind of knows it, but he's still maybe afraid to live in the present but he knows that uh, he's distorting reality um, but he's still doing it but he knows he's doing it so he's not uh, totally believing his unconscious fantasies right um, but a person who's maybe more on the extreme side of the schizoid dilemma if it's very very uh, Extreme. So we're not really talking about the extreme point, but he was making the point that the schizoid dilemma towards a very extreme, uh, the person has these projections onto others and then thinks they're real. He thinks his outer world, his inner world, which he then projects into the present, and then he thinks that's real in the present. Okay. So if he, if he has an image of his mother as being rejecting and refusing, and he projects that onto a non-threatening substitute other, he suddenly thinks this safe other person is so terrible and dangerous or something. He's talking about the inner danger that he has inside, you see. So there, there's the skits, that's a more, uh, um, he's losing touch with basic reality if he goes that far, where he thinks uh, a safe uh, person is suddenly, uh, a mon you know, so dangerous and he's, convincing himself that it must be because he's so influenced by the inner world to such an extent because it's so tra traumatic down there 
he, he then sees the present world in a, an attempt. It's actually meant to be an attempt for him to see what's in his inner world. His projections, Lachlan says, are a mirror for the person to see his inner world. So if he's projecting these exaggerated opinions onto others, that's meant for the person to see what he's denying in himself. He's denying an unconscious ambivalence towards the mother. If the splitting defense mechanism is still there, if this inner world is very traumatic and painful and psychically inside, um, we can say that's uh, an unconscious ambivalence towards the mother. The person is not aware of it. If it's too painful, he's not aware of it. But it's unconscious, and he, see, and he can see that, is, that he has this unconscious ambivalence towards the mother with prejudice and all of these projections and, and so on. You know. um, if he's putting down non-threatening substitute others, uh, he, he's, uh, he's in the repetition compulsion of when he was a baby, he couldn't protest against his mother being unavailable. Now in the repetition compulsion as an adult, he wants to protest against his mother. But how is he doing it? He's projecting his fantasy image of his mother onto someone in the present and then reacts as if the present were the past. So it's a huge distortion of basic reality that way. You know. um, so sometimes this is called shadow work. You want to own your projections. Someone called owning your projections mental hygiene. If you own your projections, that works towards integrating the inner, the healing the internal world. When you own your in, when you own your projections, you're working towards healing the internal world. A healed internal world is is psychological, emotional, spiritual health or mental health, right? You know. So mental hygiene is the act of owning your projections. The result is the health that comes from it, because. When we uh, own our projections, we're re reintegrating back into ourselves something that we don't know about ourselves. We're accepting something about ourselves that we previously didn't know about ourselves. That there are these unconscious memories of the mother being so frustrating that we're projecting onto others. You know? um, so analysis or withdrawing projections leads to integration. That leads to synthesis. When there's a synthesis of the parts, then things are more realistic. So the primary synthesis is the image the baby has that the mother is a goddess and the image the baby has that the mother is a demon. When, she, when the baby brings these two images together, okay, by the age of three, the baby sees that the mother is a real human being, an ordinary person, a, hum, a, person, a, hum, a, full, a person with emotionality, a feeling person, not a goddess or demon. So the synthesis brings a new evolved realistic healthy proper you know psychologically aligned uh, uh, perspective right rather than these traumatic you see in the trauma splitting is a way to deal with the pain of the trauma all right so if there's if the baby is traumatized and that psychic structure is all good all bad that leads to all of this prejudice we see and uh, or extreme opinions not being able to look at the two sides of the coin or the third side of the coin that unites the two sides, you know. So when there's pain, splitting is considered an infantile immature defense mechanism. The defense mechanism of splitting or the splitting defense is meant to be existential hearsay by the age of three. With enough love, the splits come together. Without enough love, the child is still using, still depending on this baby defense mechanism of splitting. So one therapist says his whole focus is to heal the splits. That's what he said, to face the unconscious ambivalence. Because then when you do though, when you do that, then you can differentiate the self-representation out from the other representation. That's, that's called getting the key out from under mother's pillow. It's called differentiation. You see, then you know yourself and you have ontological sense of self and basic that way, that way. Rather than being in this unconscious battle with the mother. And then this unconscious battle with the mother is then projected into the present situation, and it's just, just it's this hugely distorting reality. So if we heal the inner world, uh, we see the present uh, more calmly and more fairly and more uh, with more understanding and 
and so on. You know. Um, okay, uh, the next one here. Fears that are hidden behind the florid uh, hysteric reaction are more like a person flung into the sea when he can't swim but only frantically uh, clutch at anything that looks like a life belt. So this, yeah, he was making a side point about the hysteric pattern. I'll have to follow up more about this, but if the person is feeling very emotional, um, he may become, it's because he's getting in touch with uh, um, his, his two fears, the, the need for love and the, the fear of love. So he might become emotional and then he might make uh, bad decisions or something. You know, my, my understanding, maybe another way of, around this is maybe this refers to the codependent pattern um, so from birth to six months if there's a rest of development there the narcissistic pattern is there the closet narcissistic pattern is that comes from there the hostile provocative attachment style um, okay some of the schizoid patterns are there in particular the one that resembles the Iago character from literature uh, there's what's called hiding behind power struggles as a character defense. Uh, there's what's called a symbiotic character disorder and a couple of others. So a lot of patterns uh, can spring forth when there's arrested development within the first six months. Now let's say the child got enough love uh, by the age of six months to heal the splits. So the splits come together. Now he differentiates. Now we say that... Um, Love and gratitude have entered the psychological picture. But let's say between six months and three, he doesn't get enough support to complete the separation individuation process. That's, we've been calling this the codependent pattern. But the codependent pattern does have this emotion, overtly emotional uh, analogy about it. Because um, with the previous pattern, it's just hate, envy, greed, schadenfreude, spite, vindictiveness, and, and all of that. So they're caught um, in anger and hurt for not getting enough love to, um, to hatch out of the symbiotic egg. For example, the hostile provocative attachment style, he's communicating according to one author that he didn't get his symbiotic needs met. And he thinks he's going to uh, fuse with someone and some other person's going to offer their symbiotic needs. It can't be done after the age of five. So it's a secondary delusion, but the person stuck there. The positive intention of the hostile provocative attachment is for him to understand that he didn't get, or to consider that maybe he didn't get his symbiotic needs met. Otherwise, why is he being so hostile and provocative towards others? So it's sort of like the baby's strong attempt to get his mother to respond and bond and love the baby and all that. Um, the schizoid pattern, um, they just withdraw their emotions symbiotic one they seem to always fuse with people well, they have this constant need to um, someone called a proxemix they don't they want to stand like one centimeter from you and the fuse like they are always kind of like, I don't know much about that I haven't covered that yet I'm still hoping to get more information about the symbiotic character disorder it seems interesting but I don't know about it um, so um, so there's a pseudo strength with that because all they think about is power. So that's their concentrated life force energy is for this power. Because like the previous part said, they didn't get the mutuality, they didn't get the genuine relationship, so they just want the power to control. But the codependent pattern, they have love and gratitude. But they're caught in between the six months period and the three, 36 months period. So they're emotional there. They're scared. I mean, they didn't get enough support to complete the psychological process. So they don't know themselves, but they feel love and gratitude because they did differentiate. So they do know themselves to some degree, but they don't know their real selves. They, they know a part of themselves. They, see, they just hatched out of the egg, but the hatching out of the egg process takes two and a half years, according to Mahler, roughly, right? From 
six months to 36 months, and they're fixated there. So the fixation of the codependent pattern or the hysterical pattern is that they're fixated at the rejection level of not getting enough support to complete the separation individuation process. Whereas in the prior grouping from birth to six months, the fixation there is at the rejection level of not getting enough love to differentiate out of the fusion with the mother. In the narcissistic pattern, they just become the mother. They don't even differentiate from the mother. They're so painful, they just, that's called identification with the aggressor. So in the narcissistic pattern, for example, um, the baby, we, we believe, we imagine that he interprets not getting enough love as being devalued, objectified, used, and all that. He rejects his feeling self. It becomes a schizoidish, schizoidal-like. He detaches his emotions. His feeling self goes into the unconscious. And then he identifies with the aggressor. He adopts his mother's impinging, engulfing, exploiting thoughts as his. Now he does to others in the future what his mother did to him to communicate that when he was a baby, his mother did those things to him. He's caught in the developmental arrested repetition compulsion of doing to others what his mother did to him. So that's the hurt people, hurt people thing. Um, okay. Uh, so, yeah, a little off topic here about the history. We'll follow up on the codependent pattern. That's sort of a separate uh, thread there. So let's let's go back to the, the schizoid pattern here. Okay, the next part here. Okay, the unconscious is the accumulated experience of our entire infancy and early childhood at the hands of the all-powerful adults who formed us. We have no choice about this creation and we can only acquire the possibility of a regrowth to normal stability and self-confidence after a bad start. If someone can give us the kind of reliable and understanding, valuing relationship, i.e. recognition by the therapist of the client's actual reality as a person in his own right, in a way that slowly sinks in and sets going new growth processes leading to the rebirth of a genuine self. A human being is not born with a fully formed ego, however, infantile. He is rather, quote, a psyche with human personal ego potential, needing good human relations in which to grow. Professor Stoller of Los Angeles says that the formative factor for good or ill is the, quote, minute by minute, hour by hour, day by day, month by month, year by year impact of the atmosphere of the parents on the child, unquote. And that is what is built in as we grow up, as the foundation of all later adult development. Our contemporary object relations theory of personality, that is, that a true self can only grow in the soil of personal relations with other selves, with other people, beginning with the baby and the mother, settles once and for all the question of the nature of the therapeutic factor as not a, quote, technique of treatment, but a, quote, quality of relationships. So that was sort of like a general description of the idea that the unconscious is not the child's fault, he did, it's not his doing, but later on, as an adult, he's responsible for it, even though he didn't create it. This internal world that the baby has to adopt, all these infantile immature defense mechanisms that he's still using as an adult, he, the person as an adult is now responsible for healing that. Even though the, it's not the baby's real choice to, to engage in those infantile immature defense mechanisms, but the baby did use them to survive his childhood. So that's, that's the idea of personal responsibility. Burglar says, we're responsible for our unconscious. Right. Masterson says, we're responsible for the inner child of the past. And uh, Wilson says, it's the moral revolution to heal ourselves. You know? 
And to know thyself means to know both worlds, the inner world and the external world, the conscious self and the unconscious self, and that kind of thing. So he says, okay, if there's a rest of development, that's a bad start. That's a fixation there. However, if there's a new relationship where another person, usually the therapist, recognizes the other person as a person in his own right, the, the reality of the person in his own right. So the reality is that this other person is a person in their own right. Okay. If, so if a person can experience that with another human being, uh, he can be reborn, because that's the soil from which the rebirth can take place. In other words, uh, it's unlikely if uh, I, 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 from this quote it would seem unlikely that uh, some kind of computer program, maybe it's educational, but ultimately it needs to be a human, uh, a human relationship for the rebirth, uh, for, for the. Uh, by rebirth, he means uh, man's main task is to give psychological birth to himself. So giving, getting that psychological birth for himself when it wasn't done originally, that's the rebirth he means. Right? Okay, one more from uh, Adler here. What Adler called, quote, the power to turn a minus into a plus is, in the end, the, quote, power to grow from being an insecure child into being an adult. Okay, so just in a maybe just a side note there, a side, an abbreviated way of saying it. How do we turn this minus into a plus? Okay, what he means is, well, we're going to grow from being an insecure child caught in the rest of development and move that into being an adult. So that's the minus into a plus. Maybe it's just an image to think that it, that healing happens. Right? Okay, the next one here. Failure then by the facilitating environment leaves the infant a prey to ego disintegration and schizoid derealization, at best only masked by the conscious development of what Winnicott called a false self on the conformity basis or a rebellious or an abstract intellectual or any other social persona basis. The young child's hunger for his mother's love and presence is as great as his hunger for food and in the consequence her absence inevitably generates a powerful sense of loss and anger. So failure then by the facilitating environment. So it's, it's making it clear the facilitating environment. Okay. Um, so the primary, the first primary caretaker, and the environment in general. Right. So the baby's first experience of the world, his world, let's say, leaves the infant open to. Okay. So. His ego being damaged, his, his conscious ego. So the conscious ego, it's, it perceives, it thinks, it synthesizes, it sees reality. Uh, it's more objective, you know, the conscious ego, the adult mind, let's say. And then uh, the schizoid derealization. The schizoid derealization is that the person feels unreal in a, in a sense. So one way of describing the schizoid problem is that the person doesn't feel fully real, like they... I think there was a children's book about the rabbit, the, the velvet teen rabbit. He wants to feel real. He says he doesn't feel real. So then there's a metaphor about the schizoid dilemma, that one there. Okay, and then in, in response, the person develops a false self. This false self can take different forms. You know, the pleaser, the rebellion, um, and so on. And the point here from Bowlby that uh, the child's hunger for mother's love and presence, her maternal life force availability, is just as great as his hunger for food. Most people will say it's even much more. Uh, the baby can, 
one quote was if the mother doesn't have enough milk it's the relationship with the mother that's more important that can compensate for that you know so he's just making the point there speaking of breastfeeding Margaret Mead found excellent breastfeeding in the friendly Arapesh tribe and drastically rejective breastfeeding in the paranoid aggressive Mundugal Moor tribe. I've never heard of either of them. I, still have to, I guess I'll have to look them up. Oh, that quote is 1935. But she's making the point here. There was one tribe where the breastfeeding was done in a very friendly, patient, loving manner. And she said that the tribe was a peaceful, friendly tribe. And there was another tribe where the breastfeeding wasn't done in a friendly manner. And that tribe, they were the more aggressive tribe. Interesting, right? So she's making the link that uh, of how important breastfeeding is. One slogan is, breastfeeding is a public good. Because if the mother's breastfeeding, it helps her to be attuned to the mother's needs. Right? How does the mother get that attunement or read the child's messages properly. Remember, the baby comes out of the womb too early. Ideally, if everything goes well, uh, the baby is handed to the mother in one motion. The cord stays, the placenta stays, stays. The idea is that the baby thinks he's still in the womb, in this extended womb. So he's, uh, mother, the hormones are all there, that facilitates the bonding. But that also facilitates, facilitates the mother. It facilitates her own maternal instinct. And that facilitates her ability to be attuned to the baby's needs. Right? So that's we can call that the friendly breastfeeding. And um, yeah, so there's a theory, a whole history about that, that some tribes were more peaceful than others. And um, I read somewhere that the Inuit are the most peaceful, um, loving, one of the most peaceful, loving people, the Inuit. And, uh, and maybe some of the others had to acquire a more, uh, yeah, I'm not, I'm not going to comment, I don't really know much about it, but, um, but uh, if, every, if every baby is breastfed and gets his mother's love, then they'll be, every tribe will be peaceful, you know. That's Lamaze's big point too, you know, um, Lloyd Damaz, yeah. Okay, so we'll follow up on that later maybe. Okay, two more parts here. In order to get a in order to get well, a client must be able to introject the analyst as a good object. So an interject is the condensation of memories. If the client has a lot of good memories with the therapist, this can then become what's called a holding interject or an internalized good object. Now this internalized good object is a part of the person now that supports the person's individuation, that supports the person's healing, and it sees the person as a, it sees the reality of the person in their own right. Um, and connected to this image of the therapy other, there's the image of the uh, of the therapy client self so that's the part of the self that feels supported and seen to achieve the psychological birth okay. so that's building psychic structure okay. if if in the internal world the image of the other is rewarding for regression or punishing for individuation okay the person needs a new holding interject that supports the child's psychological birth so that's building psychic structure that way. Okay, last one here. All clients are hurt children at heart. All clients are hurt children at heart. Very slowly, perhaps over a period of years, as client and therapist work together, the client grows. Okay. A uh, little the client grows by little and little out of the legacy out of an unhappy childhood 
in and through the medium of his relationship with the therapist until at last the mature human being can emerge into healthy and active self-expression and self-fulfillment. So just a thought there. Love your wounded neighbor with your wounded heart. He's saying here, all clients are hurt children at heart. That's a, that's a realistic perception. If, uh, someone's, um, if someone has an insecure attachment style, someone has the narcissistic pattern, hostile provocative style, schizoid pattern that resembles the Iago character, caught in a power struggle as a character defense, some kind of symbiotic disorder, uh, a codependent pattern, that's hurt, that's hurt. So all clients are hurt children at heart. Yeah. Okay, so more reflections on the healing journey. Um, so just uh, maybe we'll close with a, a song here. There's a rock song from the 80s from a band called Santers. Um, I think this will pass. I think we'll be able to hear it because it's a, a live version of one of his Santers, Rick Santers, one of his songs that didn't get put on a, a CD. So I think this will be okay. Um, it says here, bootleg. <laughs> so the song is called uh, Dreaming. So thank you very much. This has been TQ 905, a follow-up to 904, a few quotes by um, one of Fairbairn's students, a guy named Harry Guntrip. I think I'm learning more about him myself now. 
Um, yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, Masterson talks about the, the schizoid dilemma and he, in one of his books uh, that he, um, Masterson covered uh, four patterns, I think. The narcissistic pattern, the closet narcissistic pattern, the codependent pattern, what he calls the borderline disorder of the self. That phrase is specific to his model. I'm just using the codependent pattern. And, uh, and the schizoid pattern. And he says for each of those four patterns, he has sort of a, an approach for each of those four patterns. And he, he says you want to first like, recognize which of those four, uh, and then you can apply the orientation towards it. For example, the codependent pattern, uh, their ego is stronger, so you can be a little more, uh, you can confront their rationalization more directly. Well, of course, with the narcissistic pattern, oh, it's, they're very hypersensitive about feedback. They think they're always being criticized. So he, he uses what's called mirroring interpretation of narcissistic vulnerability. And then for the closet schizoid, and uh, from the closet narcissistic pattern, uh, a little bit similar. And then the schizoid dilemma, he interprets the, the schizoid compromise. You move close, you feel you're going to be abandoned. Uh, uh, engulfed, you move, you withdraw, you feel you're going to be abandoned, then you move forward, then you're going to, and he, could, he does this oscillating thing back and forth. So I think uh, Guntrip here has uh, done, a, done a, a real service here. Uh, hopefully we'll have more quotes uh, by him. So in the first part here, uh, he was uh, talking about Melanie Klein's theory that we all live in two worlds, the inner world and the outer world. And the inner world influences how we see the outer world. If we heal the inner world, we're going to see the outer world more realistically. Yeah, we if we're more traumatized, uh, then we're not seeing the present world more. Uh, we're not seeing the present. I think we might have one of the birds pay a visit. I haven't seen them in a while. Tune, a tune called Dreaming. Here's one of our wise birds. Okay, there we go. <laughs> that was quick, huh? Oh, there's another one. Nice landing there. <laughs> he takes two and he's off. Oh, my goodness, look at that. There's a third one. <laughs> He takes one. Will he go for two? Yes. He's got the two. Okay. <laughs> He's dreaming. How about the man he used to be? You know, that's something about mourning. One aspect about mourning is mourning who he could have become. You see, part of the healing process is mourning who we could have become had we had a secure attachment style. That's something that has to be mourned. It's interesting, right? There's a whole book called that, Mourning Who We Could Have Become. Yeah, um, Melanie Klein is, uh, talks about the two worlds, she talks about the defense mechanism of splitting, she talks about projective identification. Melanie Klein has made a huge contribution to understanding ourselves, as have Fair Bear, Mahler, Masterson, Burglar, and Karen Horney, and others, of course. And maybe even Adler, I don't know much about him. But uh, Guntrup is saying that the schizoid dilemma can also be viewed as, or formed as, or framed as a superiority complex in reaction out of the inferiority 
complex. So the inferiority complex is the pain of needing to exile the feeling self into the unconscious. So the person feels weak by that or hurt by that. And, it, and if there isn't mutuality there, then the person compensates. And that's the so-called power complex. Mary Woodman talks about the power complex. If the person doesn't have a neutral relationship. Oh, they're quite active today. <laughs> Oh, step aside, he says. <laughs> okay, I'll just uh, leave them be there. Yeah, we haven't seen the birds in a while. So the three companion animals in this series are the crow, the blue jay, and the fox. They make occasional appearances. Santers, my goodness, uh, what a talent. He's one of the best... Uh, what, one of the best bands is called Santers. I think they had four albums. Um, and then uh, and then Rick Santers went on his own. And we played one of his songs from a solo album called The Dream in a previous video. Uh, okay. Uh, we also covered the idea that... Um, one problem with healing or one area around healing is facing an over-exaggerated emphasis on infantile megalomania in the service of the anger they feel and the quest for power they feel. So that's the superiority complex to, to deal with the hurt child. So we could say that's sort of a So, you know, this, uh, this kind of aggressive power or power over, that, that's not innate. It, it's a response to not being loved, right? So, hurt, so hate it comes from when, a per, when the baby's not loved, then he feels angry and hurt. It's not innate. If a child is loved, like that tribe there, what are they called? Okay, so if you visit the Arapesh tribe, uh, there's no aggression or power over because they were all loved. It'd be interesting to learn more about that tribe. It's a tune called Dreaming. A tune called Dreaming. Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, the crows are quite active. They're still, still there. <laughs> so they cleared off the snacks within just two or three minutes, right? Okay, what else we had here? Okay, um, the idea that the unconscious is not the child's fault. If the child has this inner world, he didn't create it by choice. It was sort of, his psyche developed it. Um, and if he's stuck there, he as an adult is now responsible for healing it, even though he didn't cause it. So that's the moral revolution, to heal ourselves, even though it's not our fault, right? So there's forgiveness there. Uh, forgiveness of the parents leads to healing, personal healing. Right. Okay, an emphasis there about uh, the relationship is the healer. Okay, another one ab about uh, without the love, the child's ego is damaged. You see, if the child's ego is damaged, it means his ego goes into the unconscious. That's called splitting of the ego, his conscious ego, and now his unconscious ego. In yesterday's video, 904, TQ 904, talked about the unconscious ego and how each 
representation of the other and self has the person's mind attached to these little parts and they're interacting in this inner world and you don't want too much of that you know uh, you want that to be healed and peaceful if the person's too wrapped up in that uh, they feel they're not they feel disconnected from the external world you know and that manifests as a fear of relationships a fear of intimacy even though they may get married they're, they're not emotionally there you know what I mean yeah. Okay, we'll follow up about Margaret Mead's work there. That's the first quote of hers so far. The idea of a new holding interject. So one metaphor is, uh, you know, if the baby eats food, well, we are what we eat. If you take in images of the parent and that becomes part of your psychic structure, it's like you are what you eat psychologically, right? So you internalize something, it becomes a part of you. Just like you take in food, you take in these images, you know, just an approximate analogy. But the idea is that when, when someone says you are what you eat, in the, in the psychology world, when they use that phrase, you are what you eat, they're talking about internalization. So if the child internalized uh, an image of the mother as being more rejecting than satisfying, that's a developmental trauma. So now he has this uh, a pattern around that. If the child internalizes an image of the other as satis more satisfying than rejecting, that's a secure attachment style. Okay, so now and they and they operate from that healthier internal object relations. Okay, the therapy process is to offer that holding interject that the child should have got by the age of three. By the age of three, the child is meant to have what's called the holding interject. Hold on a sec, we got some of the babies here. Let's see. Oh, some of the baby crows are here. Okay. Yeah, whenever the, the snow melts a little bit, uh, the birds come on the grass there. Okay. Um, so just uh, leave it here for today. So thank you very much. This has been TQ. 905 more to follow the song is called dreaming by santers yeah high energy singer yeah okay bye for now thank you